our next uh, keynote speaker. Uh, he's no astronaut, but he is clearly a high flyer. Uh, and I say that uh, with a lot of pride that uh, Mr. Rajiv Kakar represents some of the best that India has to offer uh, as a banker, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a business leader, someone who spent a lot of time in parts of Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, uh, and has been founding some very exciting companies. But to start with, uh, he's really been to some blue, blue ribbon uh, institutions, uh, IIT Delhi, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Uh, he's actually in the advisory board with uh, Booth School of Management, University of Chicago, uh, SP Jain, uh, Global Management Institute in the Middle East. I've spoken with him. He's very passionate about education. And more important, uh, he was the CEO at Citibank, uh, overseeing their operations in Turkey, Middle East, and Africa. He then went on to found two sterling financial institutions in Fullerton, as well as Dunia, uh, and again had some very uh, high-end uh, sovereign funds to invest in that in the financial sector. Uh, subsequently, he is now on the board uh, advising on governance and other issues with Gulf International Bank uh, in Saudi Arabia, with CID, Commercial International Bank in uh, Egypt. Uh, he's been a nominee of the Asian Development Bank uh, so it has been a real honor having to meet and get to know uh, Mr. Kakar and uh, thank you for the time uh, that you've granted us. Would love to hear your contrarian and more disruptive point of view about the role of technology as an enabler uh, to bring back growth, uh, considering the existential crisis that we faced over the last year. Over to you, Mr. Kakar. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, I hope I'm, uh, uh, if, you know, I'm audible. You are. No, it's an absolute, absolute pleasure to be here. So thank you. I, I don't think I deserve all those nice words, but you're always very generous. Thank you. But I have to say, uh, hearing uh, Ray speak uh, was absolutely surreal. I, I've never met a live, uh, real astronaut. I've always wanted to meet one. The closest I got to uh, uh, after I did my engineering, I was heading to the U.S. Uh, in cold Rochester to do, uh, I'm talking about 35 years ago, um, or 36 years ago, to do something called robotics, and it sounded absolutely bizarre. And I was going to do a PhD in robotics. Uh, and it sounded silly because people wondered what it was. It sounded like I wanted to make toys. And, um, and uh, I wish I had done it. I didn't do it. I went ahead and became a manager and did, um, uh, got into management at the IIM. But um, it's strange how the world proves to you that robotics today is something that is so important. But you know, the topic as I was looking at it, uh, so much, I, I really didn't know how to address it. So I just thought I'm gonna take a different tack to it today. And uh, technology as an enabler for getting growth back. I know I'm talking to a technology company and I know there are several people from the technology function out there watching me and they all know I don't know a damn about it. So. I shall spend my time focusing also on technology and the use of technology, but more importantly on a few very nice words you've used in your, um, in your title uh, topic. An enabler, I wanna talk about what an enabler is. We often get so obsessed with technology thanks to technology companies, which are so visible, thanks to buzzwords uh, that consultants have promoted, which are so visible. And the second word is growth. What the hell is growth? And why do we have to get it back? And because we just lost it. And why do we lose it? So, you know, for me, I, I should try and spend some time. I don't have something as exciting to talk about um, as Ray did, but I did learn a lot from what she, she said. And I think I, I love the bit when she said, human mind tends to forget. Even after we learn from the past, we tend to go back and make the same mistakes. So the fact that our growth has gone away, as a banker, I can say it's largely because of the defects of us as humans. But anyway, let me get to the topic. I, I, you know, I was kind of making some notes. I was thinking of what I would say. Um, uh, and I said, you know, what the hell is growth? Uh, if you don't mind me using some of those words, I don't mean it negatively, but 
you know, growth is good. Is it good or is it not good? And I think the wide consensus is, is definitely not only good, but it's necessary. Imagine life without growth. It would just not be worth it. And whether you're a company, whether you're an individual, whether you're a business, you need to constantly grow. And, and growth is not just in terms of profits. It's just not in terms of revenue. But growth is in terms of evolving yourself, transforming yourself, becoming something different. And there are really no boundaries to growth. So, you know, when I sit in a, in a meeting or when I talk to people and they say, oh, but, you know, the environment is not good. There are too many headwinds. Uh, there is no growth. And I often go back thinking to myself, sometimes I'm very vocal. The growth is really limited by your ability to think. There's always growth. So even in the worst of crisis, there's growth. So, you know, linking back to your topic today, crisis to opportunity. I know it's such a famous buzzword. I've been speaking about it over the years in every crisis. But it's a nice, fashionable phrase to use. The fact is there's always growth. What you really need to drive growth is to be disruptive and creative. And I think that is the issue that people tend to forget. And people think disruption only comes when there's technology. People think disrupt disruption comes in when there is a, a rapid reset that we're going through today. That's not true. We're constantly reinventing ourselves. And hence, I hate, hate the phrase new normal because there's always a new normal. The fact that you talk about a normal curve, which is nature's most common phenomena, means that everything works around a measure of central tendency. I use my engineering and statistics a bit. But what does it mean? We get obsessed with technology, but we don't realize that means and averages actually take you to the, it, it, it reverts you to the center. What the world needs for growth is for you to be, or for any of us to be outliers. And, and hence, we all get inspired by outliers because those are people who think out of the box. Those are people who go out. And the second thing is, growth, growth doesn't have to just come in terms of maximizing shareholder value. And I say that for everyone who's watching this. I say that even for yourselves as you run a business. I know you, know, you run a business for profit. But today, unlike what Milton Friedman said in 1970, and this issue is being, he won the Nobel Prize, he's a Chicago professor. His, he's being talked about a lot. A lot of his theories are being challenged because he said that a manager has no objective other than to maximize shareholder value. He's not dealing with his own money, he or she, and has no business uh, to, to spend it on any other thing other than maximizing social uh, the shareholder value. A lot has changed since then. We've seen movements around the world and people realize that a company needs to do good as well. So you need to make profits, but you also need to maximize shareholder welfare. And when you're talking about welfare, you're talking about growing your business in a way that you empower people, you enable success. And people are not your own people. People are your clients, people are your old members in the community and enrich lives, which is something I live by in all the businesses that I've built. And it should be about leveraging efforts, initiatives, so that you create a broader level of equitability in the society. You make a genuine difference. You don't sit back and create differences and you drive inclusion. And, and you know, inclusion, again, we tend to think of stuff at the base of the pyramid. Inclusion means including people in the mainstream. It could be even big companies. It could be companies like yourself getting included into getting opportunities which people can crowd you out of. So whether it's environment, whether it's healthcare, whether it's, ed whether it's education, I think our businesses need to focus on areas that uh, are the pressing challenges of this world and the social challenges of this world. And it's not just an emerging market problem. It's, an, it's a developed market problem even more. And I say this because the problems everywhere in the world are education, environment, lack of adequate means of livelihood, which is poverty and, and glaring poverty in emerging markets. But I think it's equally bad in developed markets like the US. I mean, the fact that there needs to be so much dole uh, that needs to go out in the form of support or to avoid people from getting evicted tells you a story. So equitability and driving with the right drivers, understanding what changes in time, uh, being the outlier rather than being the person at the mean, being someone who looks at the front view mirror rather than the person who looks at the rear view mirror and drives. And the unfortunate thing is, is that most managers and companies today are, are less forward looking. Most of them are, and I mean this well, please, I don't mean this uh, negatively, but most of them get driven by factors and you know, facets that they, they hear in the world. And the people who are most responsible for that is, is social media, is press, is journalists, is consultants, it's, and it's, it's people who are running businesses that who profit from it. So there's nothing wrong in terms of what they try to do but I think the problem lies in how we treat the availability of information. And so I, I think when we talk about growth, I, it's very important that growth has to be good. And if growth is good, anything is good, 
then this world and nature and the universe is self designed that it will not go back. It will not go away. So we don't have to get it back. So I'm going to focus a lot on that. The other way is that if you always want to be ahead of how the world is, and if you want to be able to grow, even in points of crisis, and crisis is defined as what we often talk about, lack of inflation, depression of prices, unemployment, but actually it is a a sense of pessimism, it's a sense of uh, a doomsday feeling where you tend to feel that, hey, I don't have hope, there is no optimism. And I think that is the part we have to learn to figure out. And the reason is, sit back, we have all outsourced our thinking, we all read in social media and buy stuff. And social media today has become so weaponized because it, it moves information rapidly and it comes in from sources where we've forgotten how to think ourselves. So definitely go out, read, read contrarian views, but form your own. What do you think at any points of time, and this is something I often do, uh, are going to define the future growth of the world. And then you have to be a part of these opportunities. You don't go for opportunities that are, going to, are reaching the sunset. You don't definitely focus only on stuff that is a frontier technology today, since we're talking about technology and it has high performance today, but also keep investing in things for the future so that you invest for the future. Whatever you're benefiting from today, trends that you're benefiting from today are a result of someone's investment uh, in the past. And everything that you invest in today will be the opportunities of the future. So decide, do you want to be the leader or do you want to be really the follower? And so I keep making an individual list, which I love to talk about. So if you've heard me in earlier session that I may have spoken at, those of us um, who, who, who have interacted with me, I used to talk about some factors. Some of them are still there which define growth. Some have evolved in terms of how they, how they look, but there's definitely there and many new factors have come in. So I'll quickly share with you, and I, I'd suggest that if we as business people look at these trends, and, and by the way, don't take this as gospel, add to it if you feel there are things that you feel uh, pertain to you. Uh, but these are broad themes that are going to define growth in the future. And keep reevaluating the list. Now, one of the first things that we have seen for the last 10, 12, 20 years is the stimulus is here to say. You know, every time regulators say that stimulus is going to go, they, they find it very high. Now, give it the name of a taper tantrum, give it the name of candy being taken away from a kid. Uh, there's no way stimulus is going away. I think our regulators globally, and especially the U.S. Fed, is caught up in a bind. There's too much capacity in the world which has come in because of credit. And on the other side, there is just too much debt in companies. There is too much debt in individuals. And, and especially after this crisis, um, even investment junk, junk rated um, uh, bonds have you know, appreciated because the world has to be saved and money is being printed and modern monetary theory for me to use an economics term um, allows you to keep printing, especially if you're a reserve currency uh, and, and without the fear of any uh, inflation. And should inflation happen and if it is, it is aided with growth, there's always the opportunity of governments to mop it back up with tax. So stimulus is here to say, but what does it mean for businesses? Money is going to be cheap. What does it mean for banks? A slightly negative connotation because banks make money when interest rates are high. But every, you know, a poison for some is a benefit for the other, for the other side. So keep looking at it. Uh, but this is the best time to invest for future growth because debt is cheap, capital is cheap, private equities are sloshed with money and they don't know where to put their money in. Uh, the other question to look at and another factor, and especially in the Middle East, and the energy equation has changed forever. There was a time when a few of the OPEC states really controlled the price, uh, but there was a, they still do and to a large extent, but the US has changed its policies, shale has come in, it tends to be the swing factor. And in some ways, I think oil will, oil is currently high. Uh, it might go up higher depending on consumption post and the pandemic, but there is an opportunity. The moment it goes up high, there's an automatic balancing technique for production to go up also on the other side. So what it means is that the originators of capital some of the economies that are dependent solely on hydrocarbons will work very, very fast in investing in diversifying the sources of income. And that is an opportunity for businesses. The Middle East itself is talking about it. Dubai, where I live, is, is aggressively diversifying and they don't have a lot of oil. But Saudi has declared its vision 2030, very impressive, and it's moving at a tremendous, tremendous pace. And uh, on the other side, there's a huge opportunity for um, economies that are guzzling hydrocarbons. They don't produce them, but they use them. They need them, whether it's China, whether it's India, whether it's the emerging market, so with some of the others. So what really matters is that there are opportunities. And the, since there's a surplus, today oil uh, producing countries will have to 
form alliances with oil guzzling economies, which really means that the supply chain, upstream and downstream opportunities, each of these things will become large. So as technology companies think as to what your part can be, if you're a financial player, there's supply chain finance, there's upstream and down, there's m &As. If you're a technology provider, you've got to look at data, you've got to look at uh, how you can provide intelligent systems, internet of things, and be able to help these businesses grow. Greening technologies are going to become a single factor. Uh, like it or not, I've talked about doing good. And um, I think greening of technologies, whether it's green, green loans or whether it is um, uh, renewables or whether you're talking about um, a new, um, um, anything that helps, uh, you know, uh, uh, the use of recyclables or whatever it is, but a lot of money from the public, private, government, uh, treasuries, et cetera, will go towards them. So it means that the direction of new spend, it's not enough to say money is getting printed. It is also a question of where money will be preferred to be invested. And whenever assets attract money, those assets get the necessary, whether it's even, even if it's medical research, if money comes into specific research or simply the headache pill has, has got more money going on research because there are many more people who need it than perhaps on a very, very, very rare cancer because there are not many cases. So it's unfortunate where we really need uh, research to go doesn't go for commercial reasons. So when you're looking at regular business, look at where capital is going to be headed. The fourth factor is populations are burgeoning. We're talking about 7 billion people becoming 9 billion people by 2020, uh, 2050. That's a massive number of people. And on the other side, technology is taking jobs away, automated things, we're creating a useless economy. What does it mean? It really means that there are lots of people there and, and with media and with weaponizing of uh, um, uh, media and influencing people, discerning um, uh, communication tools, people are also more aware. It's, it isn't like the 1800s or the early 1900s when people lived in their little cocoons and didn't really care about how good things were. So there are lots of aspirations. The world is gonna be very, very young. And so there is a need to understand that we can't provide things alone. So there is a need for the connected economy. There is a need for platformification. Platformification has not happened today because of blockchain and AI and all the fancy things that technologies, the technologists love to tell us about. It's happened because the world needs it. It happened because the opportunity is there. It's happened because now there's capital to be able to support it. It's happened because the developed world for once recognizes that all its wealth can only survive if the emerging market populations are included in the mainstream, right? I mean, we were hitherto in the emerging world ignored because we were just the producers and we were often the ignored minorities. But today, 50 to 70% of the world's growth really comes from emerging markets. And this equation is going to rapidly change. So you cannot possibly be rich if you do not worry about being inclusive. And I mean this about superpowers, I mean this about our private lives. So what does it mean for all of us in the Middle East and this part of the world? What does it mean for companies in the US? What does it mean for the company start focusing on markets globally? I know I'm today the guest of a company that's quite global in its mindset, but each of us sitting here also have to become global in our mindset. But for us, opportunity is great. We are sitting in a region which is rich in capacity. It's close to probably and contiguous to some of the largest populations in the world. And you know, differing stages of business, differing stages of market, just imagine, we have, today we have acceptability of people wanting to live in the Middle East and embed themselves in the Middle East. So there's an attraction for talent. So you have talent, you have capital, you have opportunity to invest in a very demanding, uh, um, contiguous uh, two to three billion uh, people population. Uh, almost most countries in the world are about four to seven years, seven hours of flying distance. Some of the finest airlines in the world are here. So the opportunities are just gonna be great. On the other side, what is the world doing? Medical research has led to longevity. And not just longevity, it, uh, it has actually led to the section of society that really has the money to consume and doesn't consume as much is now becoming relevant because people also want to live their lives till a longer age. People often, people like us often say the, the 50s are like the 30s. In some, in some ways it's wishful thinking, but in some ways it's very true. So um, on one side, you have the youth coming up with their needs. On the other side, you have the emerging geriatrics, if I may use the word, which, who have the wealth, who also need, and who are highly aware, they're no longer just going to be confined to a wheelchair. They want to fly around, they want to travel. So we have a larger target market, but we have a very, very strong need to become segment focused. The one size fits all approach doesn't work. So whether it's emerging markets, whether it's individuals, and further, let me break it. Conventional marketing went ahead and created segments and 
and uh, tribes and said, you know, all such people with this age, with this gender, with this kind of background would consume this. Forget it. All of us in this are fairly similar, equally cosmopolitan, similar education, speak a common language, but we are all probably thinking of different things. People are interpreting, if at all they're listening to what I'm saying, things differently from what I probably mean them. And that's the richness of diversity. That's the richness of diversity of thought. So what does it mean? We really need to decode each and every individual's mind. Nobody's a tribe. Even in people's families, everyone has a different mindset. And what allows that to happen? Today, AI, technology, data, analytics actually allows you a way to figure out how to decode people's minds. So it's not a buzzword about data warehouse. It's not about let's buy the technology and microservices. Let's, let's go ahead and you know uh, buy so-and-so core bank system or core such and such system and link with a SaaS. But you have no objective in mind. So if you don't have a plan, but you're just getting into buzzwords, you'll co collect a lot of clunky structure. You'll collect a lot of technology-led initiatives, which frankly won't succeed. So I say this with trepidation. I know a lot of the technology people will want to aim the gun at me and shoot me, but it's true. Technology is a means. And you know, that's got what gets talked about. What's really more important is to understand your proposition. So the size of the market is large. And please understand, technology is taking jobs away. The population is growing and is getting discerning whether you're old or whether you're young. No business survives without a customer. So we really need to make sure that people A, can consume, and to, that, to do that, they need to earn, and where are the jobs? States can't produce for it, SMEs can't do enough of hiring, so the gig economy is emerging. So the gig economy is not emerging because there's Uber today and Airbnb, that's so often talked about. The gig economy is emerging because people really want to do something and there are not enough opportunities. And people are bright, people are energetic, they're focused, they're creative, and they have to survive. That's Maslow's basic need, right? And uh, to do that, there's a massive need to do things on your own. You also want to de-risk yourself and not be linked to one employer. So the gig economy allows you to work simultaneously for, for four or five or 10 people. And then even if one or two fire you, you still remain in existence and you don't have to be worried about a job. So mindsets are changing. Another word that I, that I love to use, mindsets are changing. So today when people are starting to focus on platforms and be able to start working on employing great gigs and governments are realizing the importance of gig and allowing regulations for gig workers to be, to, be, to be employed by companies, making contracting rules easier, putting in some kind of governance to make sure they're not misused, looking at wages, looking at uh, including these people in the mainstream and getting value out of it. So what that means is gig and inclusion, the gig economy and inclusion is a great opportunity for people to do business. And the gig economy players need remote working tools. They need SaaS tools. They need special training, skilling, education. So whatever business you're in, even if you're selling a tool, sit back and worry about how you make adoption make uh, happen. A factor which I think we often forget living in Dubai, but in most parts of the world, when so many people are growing and things are, people are getting affluent and buying more and buying more cars, congestion in cities is growing. And so with congestion come new technology-based, technology enabled, but innovation run solutions, which I think we should focus on. And this is where smart cities, internet of things, gig, teleservices, public transportation, hyperloops. So all these inventions were possibly thought of in the 80s. None of this is new. We are talking about it today, even Bitcoin, sorry, uh, crypto um, blockchain or uh, data has always been around, but its use incrementally to get the value out has not been done so far. It, these, these capabilities have not been, or these tools have not been mined enough because the opportunity is only getting realized today. So please don't get carried, uh, carried away with the fact that these technologies are new. These technologies are very old. These technologies are relevant today. And so there's been a whole path of development happening where um, uh, Wi-Fi, 4G, and 4G now moving on to 5G, smartphones getting cheaper getting and driving inclusion and acceptance, more and more uh, mobility-based options coming in, which is going to lead to clouds which is going to be, you lead to cloud solutions, et cetera, because mobility is important. Mobility helps the producer, but mobility also enables you to do things. And hence, congested cities will, be, will need those kinds of solutions. On the other side, digitization, a word I hate. I have to say I hate it. I hate it because, you know, everyone, it, it's a buzzword. You go into a board, you go anywhere else, and people say, oh, we are digitized. 
And then digitization means different things to different people. I have an app, so I'm digitized. I have a website, I'm digitized. Or, you know, I can press this and I can see this and I'm really digital. And, the, and then who reports on you? The media reports on you because whoever pays the most gets the loudest sound. But actually digitization, of course, it's a means to get it. But without a value proposition, without knowing your customer, without knowing how you're going to pass it, won't work. One size fits all doesn't work. How, my, how I access my bank, how my dad accesses his bank, and how my children access the bank. Sorry, they don't, they, we all do it very differently. Uh, you know, and we're talking different generations. I'm talking about my wife and I. We do it differently. So even people who are in the same generation tend to deal with things differently. And hence, mobility solutions have to be segment-centric. They have to be user-based and experience-based. Look at the amount of opportunity that exists. And it's not about standardizing and copying. And finally, and that's the 10th item I was, one, I was going to talk about, it's innovation and creativity. And basically, that is the only element with all these great opportunities there which is uh, which is what you should should drive growth and you and just tell me if you're innovative and creative even in a down situation there's growth for you and if there is enough and i talked about this factor in a, in a while if there is enough creativity and innovation in this world then frankly the universe and nature and the supreme being whoever it is um, you know who developed and created or created all of us left enough matter for us in our lifetimes and i'm talking about lifetimes of this universe over billions of years, there's enough mystery out there for each of us to sit back and discover. And now, let me talk about the next thing. Why are we worried about uh, crisis if there's so much opportunity? You know, there's growth, there's opportunity, especially in a time when there's so much money sloshing around. So, you know, a lot of people say, if you use Karl Marx's example, land, labor, capital. So yes, I want to do things, I have it, but I don't have the money for it. But guess what? There's so much money. Traditionally, capacity has exceeded demand, Traditionally, there was too much debt in the world, but you know, central banks and governments were misaligned, each selfishly looking at their own needs. And so money was tight somewhere, money was, was available in plenty in some places. But today, for once, not by accident, but by, by a global repeated set of crises and you know, the same solution being applied, there's so much, of, uh, so much of money because governments and um, regulators are out of ideas. So the easiest thing to do is to go out and print money. So they're aligned in this common action to keep printing, to keep providing money so that people can do something and hopefully at least we protect those who are, who are technically bankrupt. And or, 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 I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you there. I just think you've given us so many wonderful things to think about. I wanted to see if I could pose a few questions from the audience to you, if you're amenable to, uh, to taking a few questions. Okay, I just had a couple of ideas to finish if you allow me. All right, then no, I'm, just, I'm just mindful of time. So if you'd be so kind right. just to finish your thinking, we, we can get to some questions. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I just take another five minutes, but I do want to talk about the solution to this is not printing, it's hyper growth. And it's in a situation there's hyper growth, I think we really need to sit back and look at all the tools and the opportunities and the availability of capital and use. So uh, the thing we have to look at as a technology company is that there's a dual track for technology. And, and as you look at dual track of technology, focus on the performing elements. And so the frontier technologies, whether it's internet of things, AI, analytics, the stuff that we are talking about is passe, that needs to be done. And there are lots and lots of businesses who have to play catch up. But on the other side, I think there is a lot more of investment needed to be able to figure out the customer end of it, what customers need, and to avoid copycatting, uh, sorry, uh, copying, or uh, being a copycat to successful enterprises elsewhere. So if e-commerce has worked or Venmo has worked in the US, for God's sake, don't build another Venmo here. Sit back and look at the specific needs of the clients and the ecosystem and build on it. And how is this crisis different from the earlier crisis? The, uh, this is a very important point. 2008, banking and energy, some sectors just fell and everything else kind of benefited. This crisis is different. This crisis has proven that those who were ahead have actually benefited more. So all these... All these technologies existed even before the crisis. Those who were future ready have actually accelerated more and gone. So it's led to a reshuffle of industries across sector and companies across sector where there are some winners who have won by a huge margin, Tesla is an example, and some who have kind of, because smart mobility was there before this crisis. Um, um, E-commerce was there before. So Amazon has shot out. Airbnb and Uber have suddenly recovered. DoorDash has done well. So it's because they saw an opportunity ahead of time. We have Travis Kalanick today, who's not working on Uber, but working on cloud kitchens. And guess what? You will have an impact. 
If you look at CRE, I think commercial real estate, that will have an impact. So what I'm trying to say is that a lot of this reset that has taken place is of trends that were invested in. So start investing in trends that you see in the future. And it's very, very important. Mindset is what I want to talk about. And another thing, Jeremy, if you allow me, but mindset is so, so important. People should not have a digitization mindset. Digitization is an incrementalist mindset. Have a transformation mindset. And the word I like is transformation because when you talk about transformation, you're talking about exponential growth. When you're talking about exponential growth in so much opportunity, then you think out of the box and you work on elements and steps that are needed. What is transformation? It's about redefining your playing field. It's about reshaping your value proposition. So the, how you break this down is really relook at your purpose for existence. See what your value proposition is. What's your reason for existence? Is it to just make money? And then sit back and see what culture you create. And culture is not agility, which is a word which is so you know, well touted and get a scrum master and spend two years of training people because that serves the bed, that serves the end, uh, end purpose of a lot of companies. But culture is about getting together as a group and seeing what makes you vibe, what makes you work. How can you sit back and empower people to make decisions? How do you redesign your operating model? This is so important. That's core to, you know, you have to do different things. You cannot keep copying other people and doing things. And the operating model really evolves around becoming flatter as an organization, not in terms of levels, but in terms of how you interact. It's very important that you become fast in decision-making. Go ahead, make a few errors. We are not in space. It, it's, not, it's not the same as a, a spaceship. Uh, we don't need to be at nine sigma on some decisions. We need to be at nine sigma when we put the shuttle up. But we need to be at nine sigma when it's, uh, when it's taking off and landing of things. But it's not nine sigma when you're talking about the kind of movies you have or the drink that you put on this. That can be three sigma, but make it delightful. At the same time, how will this work? And the biggest growth driver is our businesses have to be linked to the ecosystem. You cannot serve the need of everyone that you want. So you have to become a platform player. You have to be data-driven. Data-driven, not because data is fine and you know, fashionable to talk about. Data is because you need to decode every person's mind. Every company is need. Every company is at a different stage. And then be continuously a learning organization. People stop learning. People think they know it all. Companies think they know it all. Companies give you 10,000 reasons why they can't be done and Ray give us great ideas. And so the area of focus is really to deliver you businesses that drive structural changes. If you drive structural changes and you know, there's part of the duality which will give you opportunity to do more of why people have to catch up. Yes, that's your performing business as they call run the bank versus change the bank. So you should have run the firm versus change the firm and try to be definitely working on the run the firm or initiatives, but you know, they'll peter out and run and there'll be a lot more commoditization there. But change the firm is where only few will be. A few like Ray who went to space, a few like Ray who despite being a lady, sat back and you know, turned out to be the insurgent that broke the incumbency of men. And by the way, that's the segment you should focus on. I think women are going to be the future segments to focus on. The last point I want to talk about, but this is really very, very important. You know, we talked about getting growth back. We talked about enablement. We talked about way to grow. But for God's sake, if growth is not good, it's not going to work. There's so much of pessimism and optimism around growth, uh, around technology, because of technologists have misused it. Today, Google, which defines our life, is also being seen as a company that crowds out small producers. They learn from data and then start producing the same thing on their Google stores. That's not right. If you start making an enemy of the same people who don't listen to you. So economic and financial reasons have run business, but today more and more political and social elements will define how you do business and economic and financial factors are important, but they are certainly not the drivers. So coming back to your business, frontier technologies like IoT, et cetera, are important. They'll pay for your bills today, but for God's sake, don't feel great. If you're looking, waiting to do an exit in your companies five years from now, if you're planning to do an IPO, if you don't have a story to say, which will also talk about transformational changes and you're, you can prove that you're, uh, you're creating innovation, you're creating the labor fluidity. You, you, while you're taking jobs away, you're helping reskill people, you're making a difference in society, you're contributing back. It's so important. And which is why BP is moving away from just being an energy producer to being an electricity producer. So it has to come with responsibility. It's, it's, it's like Volvo years ago, which is still today known as a company, which is the safest in terms of automobiles that invented the safety belt, the three-point safety belt. They gave the technology and the patent away for free. And they remembered they haven't lost their crown in terms of uh, being the safety company.
But guess what? They gave it away for free. So sometimes giving away for things for free, what seems expensive is actually cheap and actually pays back for you in many ways. So the last thing is please staff yourself well. Sorry, Jeremy, staff yourself well because there's one thing in the world which is equitably distributed, which is smartness of the mind, which is bright minds. And, and that's one thing nature has made sure is democratized. So give people opportunities, stop them in yourself, allow them to think, make it safe to fail, make it safe to fail, don't build uh, fail-free systems. And by my, I'm sure to God that there's enough opportunity, enough capital, enough stuff there to make you and all the people in the business successful. Apologies. No problem, and thank you for a very, very interesting discussion, uh, Rajiv. Those were uh, several really provocative, interesting points. I've got a question or two from the audience. This is a double part question. Uh, I wonder if you can uh, can help our, our, our questioner. The first question is, how soon will open banking hit the GCC market? And the second question related is, with Sama's 2021 directive, UAE ADGM's regulatory sandbox in tandem with its central bank, will it impact the trajectory in a positive way? So um, I think it's a brilliant question, but it makes me, it gets a smile on my face because in 2017 and 18, when I used the word open banking in my own board, uh, people thought I was uh, talking about some vague concept. Uh, I, I was raising money for one of the ventures I invested in and people didn't know what, what the hell open banking was. But look at how, this is like the Moore's law. Two years later, it's the buzzword. It's the buzzword. Everyone now talks about open bank. At that time, there was only the UK with the regulation and there was PSD2 uh, in Europe that had come out with the regulation. Today, every regulator is doing, doing the same. So in some ways I've addressed the issue because the need is there, the time is right. If you're not gonna be in a connected economy, if your APIs are not gonna be open, if you don't have a platformification approach, uh, it no longer will work. I think it's brilliant that the, the, the Saudi and the, uh, you know, the ADGM and other regulators around the world, it's not just in this part of the world, it's happening everywhere, have provide the, provided the regulatory framework, have legitimized this operation because with regulation comes credibility and with credibility comes more capital. And there's enough innovation, as I said. So we are going to see so much more happening on the space. And I do know, uh, you know, on the other side, as I sit in uh, various forums and businesses, et cetera, or even where I invest in, there's a lot of capital going into it. And there's a lot of innovation going into it. I think a lot of people are moving into this part of the world because there are also incentives to be able to make that happen. And the biggest strength of um, this part of the world in Saudi and in the, uh, in the UAE and other parts of the GCC is that you have this captive area of Africa, you can reach out to the Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, you're talking about two, three billion people. And at the same time, a lot of people, this is perhaps the only parts of the world where globally expats are willing to come in and live. So when it comes to diversity of population, I can't think of any part of the world, not even the US, not even Europe, not even Asia, not even cities like Singapore have the level of diversity of populations as we have in the Middle East. And now we have an engine on the ground with Saudi driving through its vision 2030, a lot of investment dollars. So again, demand is going to come up. Uh, the social changes are taking place. The, the UAE has a lot of capital and we're talking about 35, 40 million people locally. Uh, the geopolitical conditions have improved. And with Israel's uh, partnership coming in, we've also got access to probably one of the best innovations in the world, apart from the fact that some of the traditional geopolitical turmoil issues are also being resolved. Egypt is a very strong ally of this part of the world. So we're going to see some massive, massive uh, opportunity building up. So I think regulation always helps innovation. People think regulation stifles you, but and, I mean, over-regulation stifles you, but some regulation really works well. And which is, I think cryptocurrency could benefit if you have a fiat currency and regulation. The moment that happens with people like Tesla now putting in a billion and a half and lots of us putting our pin money into this money and red, you know, Reddit and all these other elements uh, growing the uh, awareness of uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin making waves. I think we're talking about blockchain technology. We're talking about open banking. We're talking about lots and lots of things, but regulation, the day we have a regulated currency coming, and the Chinese are ahead of it, 
we will see a massive inflow. So even open banking coming in with the regulations, I think is going to really change the world. We're already seeing a lot of it everywhere. Great, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Kaka, I can't thank you enough for the uh, excellent insights you've shared. Really love your thoughts about the, uh, the need to move fast in the presence of abundant capital and the needs to leverage some of the emerging threads around platformization, leverage, scale, uh, uh, moving towards the gig economy and working for multiple masters instead of one. These were really, really interesting and provocative threads for us, uh, I think, all to, to, to take into account uh, as we're planning up 2021 and 2022. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here and my apologies for overshooting on time. All good.